A young mother disappears without a trace in Lake Oswego, Oregon. She's had a fight with her husband and walked out. She's missing, and so is the family car. Police suspect the husband. A local psychic's visions reveal there's been a murder. But will a partnership between the psychic and the cop put the killer behind bars? March 31st, 1986, the police in Lake Oswego, a wealthy suburb of Portland, Oregon, get a call from 28-year-old John Burke. He reports that after a late-night argument, his wife, Alexis, left in the family car. She hasn't been seen for three days. Local detective Robert Lee is assigned to the case. At that point in time, we didn't really know for sure that a crime had even been uh, committed. I mean, let's face it. Uh, couples split up. I mean, it happens every day. They have arguments. One or the other will take the family car and leave. But that theory just doesn't fit this situation. In this case, there is also a one-and-a-half-year-old child that had Down syndrome, and it would be extremely unusual for any mother to leave her child. Alexis was a very beautiful woman. She was a person that would never stay gone for more than a few hours at a time. Lee and his investigators suspect the husband as being less than truthful about what happened three days earlier. John Burke was lying to me through his teeth. His reactions were real bad. His physiological responses did not match what he was saying. And my impression was that whatever happened to Alexis, John was responsible for it. I went back and essentially knocked on the man's door to interview him. And I asked him if it was okay if the crime lab could take a look at the apartment. He said yes, and I signaled for the crime lab to come in, and we conducted our interview outside the apartment while the crime lab did their work on the inside. They found nothing suspicious, so they focus on finding the car that John Burke claims Alexis drove off in. We reasonably expected that if we found the car, we were going to find Alexis. Driven by increasing concern and frustrated at the lack of progress in the investigation, Alexis's mother takes an unusual step. A family friend recommends she call psychic Lori Macquarie. Over the phone, Lori immediately gets impressions about a very violent encounter. But the very first sense I got, even without a picture, just hearing Alexis's name, I felt that she was gone. I felt that very strongly. It's like a heaviness right in the middle of my chest. So I described Alexis, her personality, which was a bit volatile, very intense. John, I thought, was lazy. I thought he was just a guy who was coasting through life, and he had absolutely no plans on changing anything. John was essentially unemployable by anybody but his own father because John's work habits were atrocious, to say the least. He didn't want to show up if he didn't feel like it. I could see an argument between the husband and the wife. Laurie's view of the night Alexis disappeared matches with what John had been telling the police, but she sees more than the argument. What I felt with Alexis and John and the argument that I envisioned was that it was in part about finances, and a lot of people fight about finances. That's usually part of a marital situation. But this was fueled by someone being on drugs, alcohol, and I certainly felt that Alexis hadn't been using it. In fact, one of the points that I made to her mom is I said, this woman turned her life around recently. And she said, yes, that was true. And I said, well, I don't think the husband had and I thought that he was a very weak person and that he was still using drugs, and that in itself was creating a problem in the marriage. I felt that there had been a horrific fight and that it had happened right there in the house and that she was no longer in that area. Within four days, police get a break. The family car has been abandoned in a rest area. Detective Lee finds it full of clues that just don't add up. Alexis was five feet, one inch tall and weighed approximately 115 pounds. She would have to be very close to the steering wheel to even reach the pedals. And yet the seat was pushed way to the back, like somebody my size or larger was actually driving the car. 
the ignition key was still in the ignition and yet the doors were locked. From a police standpoint, that's what we call a proprietary interest in the car. Uh, somebody might purposely leave the keys in, but he wants to lock the doors because he doesn't want somebody to, to take his car. There was a open map with a city in Washington that was circled. The fact that the map was there to begin with was disturbing because to us it felt like a setup right off the bat. Although the car reveals unsettling information, Detective Lee knows he needs hard evidence a crime took place. We did get a couple of dogs to search the entire rest area to see if there was perhaps a, a body that was around there and came up with nothing. Detective Lee's case has gone cold, so when he gets a call from Alexis's mother saying she's contacted a psychic, he's skeptical but willing to listen. A police investigator really takes information, sometimes from oddball type sources, and runs with that information just to see if that information is any good, if it can be corroborated you know, by another direction. And I'm a left brain thinker. I'm very good with things that I can see and touch feel that make reasonable sense to me. So I contacted her by phone, and I have to admit, I probably was a little bit more flippant than I probably should have been. I can remember that particular day, Detective Lee calling me and telling me that he was the detective working on the case, that he wanted to take me to lunch, and he wanted to check me out. It didn't sit well. Detective Lee is anxious to hear what Laurie has to say and convinces her to meet him for lunch. Oh. Laurie just wants to help find Alexis's body for her family. She told me an awful lot about my case. I see numbers. Laurie tells Detective Lee that she keeps seeing the number 15. He's intrigued. Alexis's car was found 15 miles from her home. Maybe that's the connection. I watched his body language. He removed his glasses and put them on the table. And I thought, gotcha, you're interested. Laurie has a flash of information about the car used so to transport there. Alexis's body. There's a larger car, older car, and as I'm almost looking at it, I'm back of it and I'm seeing the trunk lid open, and it's a huge trunk. Detective Lee can't see the link. Alexis's car is a two-door with a small trunk, not the larger car Laurie's describing. When you're talking about a, a car, a big car, spend the next five minutes driving the highway and you'll see a hundred of them. Lori's next bit of info makes Lee even more skeptical. She told me that the younger brother, Kelly, was involved. I had interviewed Kelly. Kelly was actually playing ball for the college that he attended in Southern California at the time of the disappearance of Alexis Burke. I can see the brother handling her body, helping carry it. I can see shovels involved, and I, I can see this family connection. We checked with the college. They verified the fact that Kelly was literally over a 1,000 miles away at the time. That automatically made eight or 10 of the other things that Lori told me that couldn't possibly be true simply because his involvement couldn't have been there. Detective Lee's investigation contradicts many of Laurie's clues, but Laurie is sticking to her guns. If she's right, Lee could be missing some crucial evidence. I remember telling him, it's going to be different than you think. It will bear me out. Wait and see. Laurie decides on a dangerous path. She takes the investigation into her own hands and arranges to meet the man she believes to be the killer. I just had to meet him. Alexis Burke, a young mother from a suburb of Portland, appears to vanish into thin air. While police suspect her husband, John, they have no evidence a crime has been committed. Alexis's mother contacts psychic Lori McQuarrie, hoping she'll be able to help police find her daughter. Lori decides she has no time to waste. Alexis's husband is packing up the apartment, preparing to rent it out, so Lori takes a risk. I knew the minute I met him, looked in his eyes, maybe if I was even fortunate enough to shake hands with him, I would get a further impression. The police found nothing when they searched the apartment. Now it's psychic Laurie's turn. He answered the door. He was very laid back. And I don't know if he was on drugs or not, but he was just very calm. And of course, I pretended to be a renter. As I went through that apartment, 
Of course, I think not just as a psychic, but I think just as another human being, I thought, where is the wife's picture? Is there nothing here? There was nothing, not a thing of hers there, nothing. And she had only been missing a couple of months, nothing. Lori's observations are chilling. And I thought, how cold. You've already buried her, not only literally, but symbolically. She's gone from your life. When I turned to leave and thanked him, I shook his hands. And when I held his hand, I can just feel these around her neck. I know that's how he murdered her. My reaction when Lori told me that she'd gone to the apartment and met John was one of utter disbelief. Here was a person that even she thought was a murderer. And I was convinced of it at that point, and yet she's going up and making contact with him in an apartment. I was very upset. After going to the apartment, that's when I began to get stronger and stronger feelings about where she was buried. But I still was a basic skeptic. I believe what I can see, what I can prove. Still, he's willing to listen. Can the psychic help Detective Lee find the body? One iota, nothing of her belongings there. Once or twice a week, we would sit in hypotheses with each other about what I think happened here and what he thinks. One of the things that Lori had come up with right off the bat was 1-5. She didn't know whether the 1-5 meant Interstate 5, whether it was 1.5 miles, or what the significance of the 15 was. In this case, 15 could very easily have been, we're about 15 miles from the place where we thought the death had occurred. And there was a place called Bell's Landing. Bell's Landing, according to Lori, was an important item as far as the relationship between John and Alexis was concerned. Detective Lee and psychic Lori Macquarie didn't know if they were looking for an actual place or not. It was like searching for a needle in a haystack. Maybe this is interesting. Right down the way over here is where John and Alexis used to spend an awful lot of time. In Oregon, Bell's Landing could either be the side of a mountain where they park machinery when they're clear-cutting an area or doing a logging operation. It could also be a landing alongside of a river. And in this area of Oregon, we have some very, very large rivers, so it's quite plausible that there would be a landing named Bell's uh, somewhere. That's the frustrating part. Sometimes I get the clues, sometimes I get the symbologies, and it's up to me to make it fit. It's up to me to do the interpretation. And it isn't always like a teletype. I wish it were. We even went out on a couple of searches together in areas out as where she had lived previously, which is not very far from here. So he made the effort. He was at least cooperative and open. You know, it's part of what I saw, but I don't think this is the spot. So you're not actually getting any... Uh, I'm of... not getting any vibes, let's put it that way. Lori told very specifically that the body was buried. Her head was just inches away from a little creek. I also felt that he had buried her where he could watch her. That meant an awful lot to us, but what exactly did it mean? Did it mean he could keep an eye on it from work? Was it near his home? And it was about that time that I was really talking to him about it's in a field, it's, there's a building, but it's not a regular building like he would just walk in and do business in. The more time they spend together, the more Detective Lee trusts Laurie's visions. They match his own hunches about the husband. She has an insight into people and places and things that I don't even understand. The scenario will play out. I will see the person. I will see the circumstances. Sometimes the reception may become a little hazy. It isn't always crystal clear. It may come in and out. But it's exactly like watching a television show. I could see him eating his lunch. He goes out there, eats his lunch, and watches the sight. The sight is, is within range. He can see it. And as long as it's not disturbed, he knows he's not in trouble. It looks like John is going to get away with murder, but Laurie's psychic instincts tell her he's made a big mistake. This was something where many people knew what had happened. 
Laurie is convinced John has told someone about the murder. Detective Lee rethinks the investigation and decides on a new approach. We used an awful lot of what we would consider to be behavioral analysis on John. We knew that if we applied pressure to John, that his past history would indicate that he would talk to somebody. And yet we didn't want to put so much pressure on him that he was going to invoke his rights per Miranda, which in the United States is a pretty big thing simply because it meant that we were no longer able really to talk directly to John without the interference of an attorney. I've always thought, you know, sometimes the best crimes in the world have been solved by the girlfriend who was dumped, and I knew that John had had a girlfriend. Just as Laurie predicted, that's exactly what happened. A former girlfriend of John Burke was living with some girls that were attending college, and she mentioned to one of the girls that she had a former boyfriend who had killed his wife. This girl contacted another girlfriend, who talked to another girlfriend about it, who talked to another girlfriend about it. The sixth girlfriend in line contacted her father. The father of this girl contacted the police department. Based on the father's tip, police track down John's former girlfriend, Julie, and bring her to Portland. She agrees to cooperate, and they arrange to tape her phone conversations with John. He said that he'd strangled uh, his wife, Julie got the impression that the body was buried. We were driving by the metal fabrication plant where John and his younger brother worked. And Julie mentioned that John became very different every time that they went by that area. But John's confession to his old girlfriend isn't enough. Police still need a body to get a conviction. Lori sees Alexis buried somewhere where John can keep a close watch on her. It makes sense it would be close to where he worked. Following his own intuition and Laurie's clues, Detective Lee decides to search the 15 acres beside the plant. Maybe this is the clue 15 Laurie keeps seeing. It has a very, very large metal fabrication building with very little in the way of vegetation. The 15 acres that was right next to it was ideal because the trees and the brush provided an awful lot of cover and concealment. Access was pretty much restricted. We sent uh, cadaver dogs over the 15 acres, and their handlers came back with essentially nothing. I was personally disappointed that we were not able to find the body. As Detective Lee and I would talk throughout the year occasionally about the case, of course, there would be times when he felt that maybe John was going to crack. And I would just always share with him my philosophy. Everything happens when it's supposed to. It's a real low point in the investigation. Without Alexis's body, police can't charge John with murder. But Lori is sure John's younger brother, Kelly, is involved, despite the fact he's given police what appears to be an airtight alibi. I think Kelly just happened to be the wrong guy at the wrong time, and he was related to the murderer. And so he helped dispose of her body. Kelly was in Southern California during the specific time frame that Alexis disappeared. And a reasonable person would believe that Kelly could not have had any involvement simply because of the time frames. He was literally over a thousand miles away at the time. I generally find what I get as a first impression is correct. And I remember telling him, I'm standing by it. It's been a year since Alexis Burke went missing after an argument with her husband, John. With the case going cold and based on her track record, Detective Lee decides to listen to psychic Laurie Macquarie and take another look at the brother's story. John essentially has no friends of his own. His best friend in the world is his younger brother. If the younger brother knows anything about it, that would automatically mean that his best friend would know all about the case. Kelly's friends and former roommates are all law students. They've been interviewed once about the disappearance of Alexis. This time, Detective Lee re-interviews them with a grand jury subpoena in his hand, threatening each with jail time if they refuse to cooperate. From what Kelly's friends have to say, it becomes very clear that Kelly knows something. He's brought in for questioning, and Detective Lee persuades him to cooperate. He told me everything I wanted to know. Yes, he was in Southern California uh, playing ball, but the game had gotten rained out. He was actually back in Oregon 24 hours earlier than he was supposed to be. It is a turning point for the investigation. 
If it hadn't been for Lori's conviction, police might never have re-interviewed the brother, and his information was just what they needed to get an arrest. Bob Lee does not give compliments lightly, but he did kind of offer that up and say, well, I guess you were right. And, and I just felt that there was a shift at that point. The deal we made with Kelly was very simple. We were concerned that because the body had been in the ground for so long that we would not be able to formally identify Alexis Burke. The dental records we had were several years old. We knew there were not going to be any fingerprints. There was not going to be anything that was actually going to tell us for certain that this was Alexis Burke and not somebody else. And that would be a loophole that a defense attorney would be able to drive a truck through. So we essentially made a deal with Kelly that we would not prosecute him in any way, shape, or form for his complete assistance in the case, including showing us where the body was. I felt that there had been a horrific fight. Kelly confirms Laurie's original vision of a strangulation. He tells Detective Lee how a family argument escalated into murder. Alexis walked out the front door, slammed the door behind her. When she got to the car, she didn't have car keys, and she was in her nightgown. So she came back and started screaming at John. He had big hands. I can just feel these around her neck. I know that's how he murdered her. He came over to her and put his hands around her neck. John said to shut her up because she was really making a lot of noise. John says he ripped off the electrical cord and tied it around Alexis's neck just to make sure that she was dead. The body was rolled up in the carpet behind the couch for at least 36 hours. And during that time frame, that at least 12 members of his family and her family were in the apartment. When Kelly finally showed up, he helped John dispose of the body just as Lori had envisioned. There's a larger car, older car. They put the body of Alexis into the back of their father's car, which was a very large Lincoln, dark in color. They then took the body out in the middle of the night and actually dug a hole about 75 yards from the corner of the building where they both worked and buried Alexis. There's water involved and not a large body of water. The body was right next to a very, very small rivulet of water. The head was the closest to that water and it was only several feet away. And of course, the body was under just several inches of dirt. Lori's visions are accurate about all the important details of the case. The brother's involvement, the larger car the body had been moved in, Alexis's body buried in a shallow grave near water, and about John keeping an eye on the site. He was able to keep an eye on the situation because he went there every single day. But John Burke still isn't in custody. Because he was out of town, he is oblivious to the discovery of the body. As it was, John showed up the next day, and he was totally in the dark. And by the time he found out about it, it was too late. And I told him he was under arrest for the murder of his wife. And I put on a pair of brand new handcuffs on him. That felt really good. John Burke is convicted of his wife's murder and sentenced to 13 years in jail. His brother, Kelly, gets off scot-free because he cooperated with police. With this murder solved, Detective Bob Lee isn't quite as flippant about Laurie's psychic abilities. I contacted Laurie to tell her, you know, all about the case and how terrifically accurate she was at that point on 28 of the 30 things that she had told me. I don't know if I feel vindicated so much as I just feel, yes, this stuff does work. And it's important for me to be right, not just for me, but I think it's important for the victim. Psychic Laurie may be good at predicting the future, but not when it comes to herself. Detective Lee was so impressed with her abilities, he proposed marriage. I never for a heartbeat thought when I met him that I was going to end up with him. We've been married now for a little over 18 years. We're a good team. <laughs>